Hi there, my name is Ling and I'm one of the junior doctors working for Nottingham University Hospitals. Welcome to this week's approach on the topic of confusion. So some of the common terms that you might have already heard in your medical journey, confusion, delirium, drowsiness, they are some of the common descriptors of an altered mental state. So these terms are commonly used to describe a state of disordered mental function and it covers a spectrum of severity. Confusion can be quite challenging to approach as a junior doctor as it can reflect a wide spectrum of pathological conditions that may present with a loss of higher cognitive function or decreased alertness. Wide range of possibilities would include systemic illness like sepsis, metabolic derangements, to intracranial pathologies such as stroke, seizure, dementia, or subdural bleed. So in the elderly, the organ of least reserve is often the brain. So coupled with the patient's inability to give a history, this presents with a unique clinical difficulty and will require some thought. So here are some of the commonly used scoring systems to assess the degree of confusion. So your GCS will be useful to assess the severity of drowsiness in poorly responsive patients, but it will not be useful in identifying subtle confusion in communicative patients. Useful quick bedside tests would include abbreviated mental tests, which then forms part of your 4AT test. This is good bedside screen of delirium in elderly patients. More lengthy exams are the MOCA, and the Edinburgh score. This is to assess the degree of cognitive impairment and it is particularly useful in patients with dementia. So before approaching any presenting complaint, it'll be useful to have a list of differential in your head or a quick list of differentials rather. So this list is not to be memorized but it is for you to use to organize and to understand the background of each possible differential. Bear in mind, this is not an exhaustive list. So you have your anatomical filter, which splits the differentials based on the region of where the pathology is occurring, whilst you have the surgical filter, which employs a mnemonic to categorize your differentials based on the category of insult. Feel free to pause this video and browse this slide. Firstly, we should ask ourselves, what is the time cost? Is this an acute change from the patient's baseline? Is this acute or is this chronic? Once you've identified whether the confusion is acute or chronic, we can then explore the approach to each time cost. In exploring acute confusion, it is important to ascertain a few things. Are there any focal neurological signs? Is there recent trauma or recent fall? Are you suspecting sepsis? Is there fever or systemic signs in general? And lastly, exploring your patient's background, past medical history and drug history will be imperative to your investigation. The reasoning to all these questions will be explored in the next slide. So in patients with confusion and focal neurological signs, there are two things that it could be. A hyperacute onset would suggest a cerebrovascular accident or stroke. In focal neurological deficits with confusion, headache and fever should suggest encephalitis or meningitis of an infective cause. So in confusion with recent head trauma or recent fall, you should really raise your suspicions on an intracranial bleed. So most commonly your subdural bleed in the elderly population. Recent falls can also point towards undiagnosed fractures, which can lead to confusion if left untreated. So it will be useful to do your head to toe screen and look for any recent chest x-rays. Is there fever or systemic signs in general? This should raise alarm bells for sepsis. Common causes of sepsis will include chest sources of infection, such as pneumonia or your urinary tract infections. They commonly cause confusion when the patient is septic. 
So lastly, you'll need to explore your patient's background or past medical history. The patient's background will be so important. Say in diabetics, you should consider DKA, hyponatremia, and HHS. In alcoholics, you should consider Wernicke's. In patients with renal disease, you should think about acute and chronic kidney disease, metabolic acidosis, and uremia. In patients with liver disease, think about decompensation. So think about your hepatic encephalopathy and assess your patient's medical list. Opioids and benzos commonly cause drowsiness, delirium, and confusion. So similarly, in chronic confusion, it will be useful to explore associated features or symptoms. Some of the questions you need to ask yourself is, could this be dementia? And if so, what type of dementia? Once again, is there a long history of alcohol excess and poor nutrition? Is there mood changes, poor mood, loss of interest in general? Are there any focal neurological signs and is the patient continent of urine or does the patient have gait disturbance? So one of the conditions commonly mistaken with dementia or confused with dementia would be depression in the elderly. So poor mood, poor energy, and loss of interest in life. It should raise your suspicion towards depression in the elderly. So it would be good to do a depression screen. A long history of alcohol excess with poor nutrition should point towards Korsakoff's psychosis. It is an irreversible result of Wernicke's encephalopathy when it is left untreated. Chronic confusion with neurological signs should point towards a space-occupying lesion, a resolving stroke, or in rapidly progressive cases, you should start thinking about Metcalf disease, Crutzville-Jakob disease. Urinary incontinence with gait disturbance, it should raise your suspicions towards normal pressure, hydrocephalus, and in patients with dementia, personality changes with disinhibition, it could point towards frontotemporal dementia. A stepwise decline with vascular risk factors, it should suggest vascular dementia. Your most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's. This is slowly progressive. And dementia with visual hallucinations or visual symptoms, this would suggest Lewy body. So in conclusion, confusion can be due to many reasons. It can be difficult to assess if the patient is non-cooperative or non-communicative. So collateral history from family and carers, it will be useful to assess baseline and any changes in baseline. Patients' past medical history, background and social history will be very important and it often contains clues to the likeliest causes of confusion. So it is imperative to perform a thorough clinical exam, look at their vital signs, look at their consciousness level, and look for any evidence of trauma or fall. So lastly, just ask yourself, could this be sepsis? Sepsis is a very common cause of confusion among the elderly. It can be very easily overlooked. So perform a confusion screen early. Take your bloods, do your cultures. UTI is a major cause. Look at your chest x-rays, look for any chest sources of infection, and lastly, if you suspect an intracranial pathology or trauma to the head, perform a CT head. Thanks for bearing with me this far. I hope you have learned something from these slides, and I hope they were useful to your learning. Thank you very much.